folks, well, thanks for coming to the breakout session. It was exciting to kind of get to come to Low Carb USA. This year was my first time, so checking out some of the other presentations and meeting all the people, um, new and old, are is always exciting. Um, and I guess I'm here to kind of discuss more or less like the application of a high fat or kind of a ketogenic type of protocol when it comes to endurance athletes. Uh, and for me specifically, that's like extreme endurance. I kind of focus on ultra marathons with, I guess, more recently uh, an emphasis kind of on the 100 mile distance. Um, but, you know, I like to dabble with other ultra marathon distances as well. And uh, I'll kind of explain how I got into the kind of high fat stuff and uh, like what kind of motivated that and then what I've kind of learned over the last nearly seven years of kind of putting it into practice and essentially kind of evolving along with the research science and the stuff that my own body kind of told me along the way and where kind of I feel like lifestyle plays a role, I guess, in like kind of how we define like a ketogenic diet or a low, a low carb, high fat kind of a diet. Um, so, just a little bit um, about me, or I should even share too that like one of the number one questions I'll always get, or maybe not questions so much as like wonderments, is you know, you, you'll you'll see on social media there'll be a discussion, and they 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 range, as I'm sure you know, from civil to quite volatile, and uh, um, they usually come down to like you know the high fat, low carb diet is optimal for this, that, and the other thing, and then someone else says, you know, high carbohydrate, you know, vegetarian, uh, vegan, whatever is, you know, it's going to go back and forth, back and forth, and ultimately what ends up happening is, you know, one group says, well, look at this person and what they're doing on this diet, and another person will then look at this person and what they're doing, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of interesting because, like, when, um, and we'll get into this more in the presentation, and you're more than welcome to ask questions about it after as well. But uh, the thing I find funny and the thing that I always am constantly kind of thinking about is as an extreme endurance athlete, if you kind of just like back up and look at one year of kind of training and racing and recovery and decide to just randomly pick out a single week, you might pick out a week where I'm training upwards to 20 hours with running, strength, mobility, and that sort of thing, burning two or three times my resting metabolic rate. Or you might pick out another week where I'm doing very little, not getting off the couch all that much, and recovering from like a 100 mile race. So for me, looking at that, I'm looking at drastically different lifestyles over the course of the year, almost like you're looking at multiple people. Um, and I think that's where you have, to, you have to start to really kind of dig in and kind of figure out some things in terms of like, what do you need to do to periodize your nutrition and your training and that sort of thing to match your lifestyle, whether that be during a recovery session or during kind of your peak training stuff. Um, so that's where a lot of my interest and a lot of my uh, kind of thoughts and research slash practice has kind of has kind of gone the last few years. Um, before we get into that, just a little bit of background. Um, I kind of had, I guess, what I would call a gradual evolution of the sport of running. I, I really, you know, I was pretty typical middle school kid who like kind of just wanted to do sports and being a middle school boy I was probably going to gravitate to whichever one I was best at because most middle school boys want to try to do well and they don't want to get beat by all their friends so um, I found out probably I think it was maybe fifth or sixth grade that we did I don't know if they still do this in schools but they had the presidential physical fitness and that um, that competition I guess or the um, uh, activity you had a mile run in it and one thing I noticed even at a young age was we finished that and all my classmates were just complaining about it They're like I'm never doing that again and I was thinking to myself I'm like no, I, I will want to do that again <laughs> so I kind of had this this thought that maybe it would be better rather than signing up for the 100 meter dash at track and field day sign up for the 800 or the mile so that's kind of my first taste into uh, into training um, very little structure <laughs> with it at that age, very little knowledge of sports me or training methodology or anything like that, um, but enough to kind of generate interest. Uh, so then I went into high school, I kind of gravitate, gravitate towards cross country and track and field and got more into, uh, you know, doing more than just kind of, if I'm going to race a mile, I should just run a mile every day and getting a little more into like the, 
the, the training philosophy around that. I had a great high school coach, so he knew stuff. Um, I probably didn't listen to him as much as I should have, uh, but it was kind of a good next stepping stone for me. Um, in high school, cross country and track was exciting enough and interesting enough to me that I tried to pursue that post high school too and ran in college at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, and that's where I really kind of started to fall in love with running and really start to get interested in more than just like, let's get to this meet and see how many people we can beat. Uh, and so that's when I started really looking into like the training methodologies, nutrition of sport and stuff like that. And, uh, periodizing your training, like what is a long run, what is a workout, how do I build my mileage to prepare for a specific event. And um, one thing I really noticed in college through my experience there was the event, or not the event, but the, the workout or the training that I enjoyed the most was the Sunday long run. And uh, our, my cross country coach would always say uh, to the group, it's like, cause you know, there was a variety of different opinions about the Sunday long run. And uh, um, our coach would say, most of you guys, you do the Sunday long run because you know it's going to be good for you and on race day. Zach does the Sunday long run just because he likes to do the Sunday long run. So that <laughs> kind of resonated in my mind. I was like, you know, maybe I should start focusing on doing longer stuff. So after college, you know, I was kind of a little tired of doing track workouts and stuff like that. And I knew I liked doing the long run, so I kind of just started doing a lot of long runs. Um, and that's where I kind of first started getting interested in thinking about ultra marathon running. So in um, 2010, at the end of the year, I did my first 50 miler, uh, and after that I was kind of hooked. So since then, uh, I've kind of spent the last, uh, I guess, seven-ish years now, uh, eight-ish years now, kind of just focusing on ultra marathons as a kind of a specific training distance. Um, so uh, the interesting thing that I found was in, at the end of 2011, I will call that kind of first uh, season of ultra running that I did, where I did more than just one event. Uh, and I, I kind of found myself in, in an interesting spot where uh, I did 350 milers in a nine week time frame. And uh, at that same time, I was, I was teaching full time back in Wisconsin and kind of through the training for those and then after those races and as I started to kind of build back up and recover from those events, uh, I noticed that something really wasn't working right for, and just in general, like general metrics for, for health and stuff. And I was a 24, 25 year old male, so like the fact that I was having things like restless sleep, like these really big energy swings throughout the course of the day, um, like swelling that would kind of linger around in like my ankles and things like that from, from big workouts and races, seemed like they were they, they, they could be easily excused as always part of the sport, which I think a lot of people end up actually doing in the endurance world is they, you know, have some of these weird ailments where like, oh, you know, I wake up three times and then I have to pee, I must just be really hydrated or, um, you know, I have big energy sink. Well, that's because I did a long run this morning. And I mean, some of that's a little natural, but if it becomes chronic, it's something in my mind you want to you look into, especially when you're at an age where, like, you're supposed to be about as robust as, as your body's going to be. Um, so these things kind of uh, showed up as red flags in my opinion. So I started to kind of question if what I was doing was sustainable. And um, there's kind of two ways to look at it in my opinion. There was my training program and racing schedule uh, or nutrition. And uh, if you look here, this is kind of what I had as my, uh, um, my training periodization in this little uh, circle graph here. And then my nutrition at the time. I, I would essentially do what I would consider a high volume training program that was periodized, meaning I'd start out with uh, you know some like low low volume kind of slow miles in those early like post recovery early base training, and that would be anywhere between like zero to ten hours a week uh, worth of work through that system of the training, and then I would get into kind of a high volume but low intensity session, which is that orange one right there where I usually average around ten to fifteen hours of training. Uh, and then I'd get into peak training, which would be where I would add some specificity workouts and things like that for whatever race I was, I was doing. So that tended to be high volume with some specific work, some more speed work like intervals, tempo runs, progression runs, that sort of thing. Um, and then ultimately taper, reduce the volume and intensity before a race, and then kind of recover and repeat that process. Uh, so that's kind of the system that I had in place for training. I was looking at that, I was like, you can easily make an argument that that's probably not sustainable to be doing that much exercise. 
Um, I think when you're talking about ultra marathons, you can easily make the argument that doing that kind of stuff is uh, past the margin of diminishing returns and when it comes to health. Uh, but I was enjoying it. So uh, part of me was like, I don't wanna change that if I don't have to, if I can fix this in a different way, let's try that first. So I started to kind of look into uh, diet and nutrition and kind of what role that plays in recovery as well as performance and things like that. Um, and you know, it wasn't like I had a very crummy diet. You hear all sorts of stories of how people get into kind of a high fat, low carb, ketogenic <coughs> kind of diet. Some people are coming from very standard American diet. Other people are coming from drastically different, but considered by others very healthy. And I would consider mine very typical whole food, healthy, high carb diet. What would be prescribed in like a lot of exercise based books, um, you know, especially a, a decade ago. Uh, and that was kind of like, like I kind of said, a whole food, high carb, like 60 to 70 percent of my nutrition from things like fruits, vegetables, uh, whole grains, things like that. And then fats and proteins would make up somewhere between 10 to 20 percent each. Uh, so pretty typical to what you see in a lot of that like kind of high carb uh, endurance nutrition type of uh, setup. Um, so what got interesting to me is ironically enough, kind of at the same time that I had uh, this this thought that maybe I should try ch changing my nutrition a little bit um, was uh, I started uh, also kind of thinking you know if I'm going to train sometimes for 20 hours a week. Uh, you sort of kind of feel guilty, like, what am I, is spending this much time running uh, very beneficial? Like, what else could I be doing in exchange for that that would be as fulfilling, more fulfilling, or more well rounded? And uh, one of the things I, I discovered at the time was podcasts were a great way to kind of kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. <laughs> so I started to listen to a ton of podcasts when I run. And, um, and that's where I kind of was first introduced to this whole idea of like a, you know, a high fat, low carb diet, a ketogenic diet. And it's also when I first kind of learned of these, these guys, Dr. Volick and Dr. Finney, who I'm sure all of you know, and maybe even watched uh, Dr. Volick present this morning, or was it yesterday morning? This morning. This morning. And then I think uh, Dr. Finney's up tomorrow at 11. So uh, these guys were kind of my like first point of contact in terms of like information. Um, so I looked at a lot of their stuff. I was fortunate enough to meet them. I was fortunate enough to meet a bunch of people who kind of worked close with them and uh, knew a lot of information and a lot of stuff like that. So um, you know, I had a lot of a lot of help along the way to kind of try to figure out well, where do I start, how do I get things going. Um, you know, ultimately a lot of it has to do as well with you know I'm a pretty curious person. So like if you know I like to kind of plan and build things. So for me this was like okay I'm gonna restructure my nutrition protocols is like tearing it down and building from scratch. So it's kind of a fun, fun uh, experiment more or less. Um, so I got into it kind of the same way uh, a lot of people approach the ketogenic diet where you know you, you look at the kind of the program, you drop your carbs down to 50 grams or less uh, and try to keep protein more or less moderate. Uh, and the, the thing that I found really interesting was I, I started it during kind of a recovery early base phase, which I think is ideal when you're talking about athletes. I think one of the biggest mistakes athletes make when they're gonna play around with a ketogenic high fat approach is they drop it in in the middle of their peak training. So, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a problem because, uh, and I usually explain that from a stress standpoint because the most stressful time uh, physically in my yearly calendar is when I'm in peak training that's when volume and intensity are the highest. So for me, like I don't fear stress. I think stress is a good thing. I think stress is a way to get stronger, but there's also you know an appropriate amount versus an unappropriate amount, and it comes from all different angles. So if I'm gonna increase my physical exertion stress, I should probably try to alleviate that. Oh, there's some stress from other areas, whether that be work, you know, social life, you know, friends, family, that sort of thing. Um, you know, try to keep that still in balance. So when you flip your nutrition completely upside down, for at least a while, that's gonna be a stress, a new stress. So like, to drop that in during kind of like peak training is like you're playing with fire quite a bit. So, you know, I was fortunate in that I kind of got interested and curious with it right after that kind of 350 mile and nine week thing. So I was about ready to take some downtime and then do a slow rebuild. Um, and the interesting thing I thought was, uh, when I started to kind of implement it, one of the, some of the first things to kind of clear up were like 
the sleeping, um, the energy levels. So like I would, I would, uh, I went from waking up three, four times a night, uh, and basically like planning a ten hour block of time at night to sleep in order to get eight hours to being able to say, all right, if I want to get say eight and a half hours of sleep, I'll go to bed at nine and I'll wake up at five thirty. You didn't really have to plan for like you know these large blocks of time where you wake up restless at night, uh, use the bathroom, or just you know have weird circadian rhythm disruptions and stuff like that. Uh, so that went away, which was, was awesome for me because historically before that point in my life when I was starting to train for ultras and stuff like that, I was a really good sleeper back in like when I was in high school and earlier, I, I was always really good at that. I could fall asleep and then wake up the next morning without uh, any issues. So when that returned, I thought that was like kind of one of the first light bulbs that went off. Like, okay, there's something to this. Um, the energy swings was really interesting one for me too because uh, at the time when I, I was teaching full time and when I was doing the high carb kind of approach, uh, I swear at like two o'clock every day, I could have laid down in the middle of the classroom and taken a nap if you would have let me. And that went away. I just had like even energy throughout the course of the day. Um, and I did notice this right away because I was earlier in, this, earlier in the training, so I wasn't getting a whole lot of swelling from big workouts or anything like that. But um, ultimately when I did get into some of the bigger workouts, I noticed that some of those like post race, post big workout, like leg swelling that you see a lot in the ultra running community would kind of like flush out a lot quicker and I felt like that was was much less of an issue um, when I kept those carbs quite low or, or out of my diet in those days after the big effort and things like that. Um, so the other thing I noticed, um, so it wasn't all completely like, let's just go strict keto, clinical keto, whatever you want to call it. Um, is when I did get out of that kind of uh, base building phase and got into some of that more intensity type training, high volume, you know, intervals, progression run, tempo run type stuff. What I did notice was uh, I felt like I could run all day, but if you asked me to kind of do a really fast workout, I was slower than I used to be. Um, it was really hard to kind of hit that last gear or really hit the gas pedal hard, especially if it was like kind of a um, what I like to call it on like a gray area level where you're not going like max sprinting, but you're not going like uh, um, kind of an easy jog that in between time frame that you can do for about an hour or so and uh, That was really kind of difficult for me um, So I was a little kind of perplexed like okay, what do I do here? And um, that's when I started getting kind of curious about like this idea of metabolic flexibility um, and kind of how lifestyle plays a role uh, when I looked at kind of the ketogenic diet as a whole, you know, a lot of that was kind of developed or structured around um, the, a lifestyle that was more or less, uh, like this person has type 2 diabetics, this person has epilepsy, you know, metabolic disorders and things like that. Uh, and that's where that, a lot of that program began. Um, and then I looked at kind of my lifestyle and I was like, if I, if I look at it from an energy demand standpoint, it's a lot different. It's a different window that I'm looking at from, because like what I said in the beginning, when I'm in that peak training, you know, I might be burning two to three times my resting metabolic rate. Um, so to kind of plug in a specific thing year round, uh, didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, so I, I tried a few different things and kind of kept in touch with uh, you know, guys like uh, Bollock and Finney to see like, well, like, what are you guys seeing in, in other athletes? Kind of in my scenario, where are they ending up? What is keto for them, or what is high fat for them? How does this lifestyle kind of, kind of play a role? And what I've kept coming back to over the last seven years is that this periodized approach, where I start out my training just like I did when I first went uh, high fat, low carb, and that's what I call like my real kind of a more extreme like fat burning engine development phase. Intensity is low, volume is relatively low, um, or just gradually building up. So I just don't need a high octane fuel source. I can get by just fine burning high levels of fat in those phases. So I can really develop that side of the that side of the coin during that phase of training. And then as I kind of start to ramp up, uh, you uh, start to bring back some of the carbohydrates with the mindset that fat is always going to be my primary macronutrient. Because when I look at a training plan, whether that be a five kilometer training plan or a hundred mile training plan, the majority of the time that that athlete, regardless of whether they're elite, you know, weekend warrior, middle of the pack or any other area, they're spending most of their training volume still in an aerobic state. 
So it just doesn't seem it doesn't seem appropriate to be giving any of those individuals a high octane fuel source at the majority of the time. They just don't need it that often. So even when I would get into kind of those peak training modes, uh, I still keep fat at the primary macronutrient. I will adjust a little bit to have some carbs coming in, and you know sometimes when I'm at my highest, that can be between two to three hundred grams, or if you want to look at it in a percentage ways, you know, it's between twenty and thirty percent. Those days are pretty rare. Um, they're reserved for kind of the big days, but uh, they are in there, so I do mention them. Uh, what I do like to do, and you can kind of see on this graph here, is when I'm in that peak training phase, that is, like I said earlier, a real stressful physical time. So I think in order to really make progress, you kind of have to do that stress stimulus and then pull back from it briefly, and then kind of do that again. And then however many times you do that is depending on your timeline or whatever race you're preparing for. So. If you look at in the middle of my training block there, you see that kind of valley there on the graph. That represents what I call a deload week or a recovery week. So a lot of times in, in a lot of endurance training programs in general, certainly mine, I'll do like around two, sometimes three weeks if I'm feeling really good of a buildup where I'm training pretty hard. And then I'll do a deload week where I back down intensity and volume, sometimes as much as 50%. So those deload weeks also represent a very good time for me to kind of reset that really low kind of strict keto um, approach in my training and just kind of remind my body like, you know, fat is the primary macronutrient. Um, and then as I kind of ramp back up to the next cycle of training, I let them drift back up there like that. Um, and can maybe come back to, yeah, let's look at this one first. We can come back to that one though. So, like it's you know everyone wants always wants to ask me like well how many carbohydrates do you eat or what is your you know like what are you eating and it's like I try to explain to them in short what I've been telling or explaining in this in this presentation a bit is like it really depends on when you look at it so what I found is like the easiest way to explain it to people that lets them know that I'm very much uh, following what is very low carbohydrate in the world of endurance comparative is I'll tell them that my yearly average carbohydrate consumption is approximately 10%. So what that mean by that is when you add up the amount of time I spend in recovery, early base, you know, peak volume, peak training, taper and deload weeks, that comes out to be about 10% on average. Um, even with the peaks as high as 30 and the lows as low as essentially nothing in the terms of carbohydrates. And that seems to be an easy way to kind of help with folks who wanna grasp to the 30% part or grasp to the 0% part and kind of cling to just that element of the training. Um, let me go back real quick here. Uh, so that's kind of like what I like to call like the metabolic flexibility side of things. Um, I think it, the interesting thing in like the ketogenic world is like a lot of times we're looking at we're, we're, we're picking kind of goals. I think goals are great. Um, but one goal I think I see pop up a lot in like ketogenic world is uh, like the ketone scores, like how many millimoles of ketones did you have? And um, I think that, that, that there's, there's probably a place for that. I think there's a place for a lot of things, but in the world of endurance, I think that can be kind of a slippery slope because uh, ultimately for preparing for an endurance race, the, your, your ketone levels at the end of the race don't determine whether you PR'd or not. They don't necessarily determine like if you maximized your performance. Um, you know, your, 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 your PRs will determine that. Like if you run faster, then you're probably doing something better than the time before, or you're improving. If you're regressing, then, I mean, it really doesn't matter what your, your ketone levels are at. So I try to kind of discourage like the ketone chasing uh, in its entirety. Um, you know, I, I will test my ketones because I, I get asked often enough, like you know, where, what level of ketosis are you in and what phases? Are you in ketosis? Are you out of ketosis? You know, all those, fun, interesting uh, kind of conversations. Um, and I think like, uh, so I'll test just to kind of see where I'm at sometimes and, and so I have, a, a, have answers for people. And really what it ends up coming out to being is, uh, you know, I like to be, when I feel my best, I like to be able to get any ketosis very quick, but I like to be able to hop out of it very briefly if I want to really nail a big workout. Um, and I think that's that ultimate metabolic flexibility. You have access to both those fuel substrates um, quite easily and there can be a learning curve for that in the sense that you have to let your body kind of uh, grow along with the approach. I know when I first started, like if I had uh, a day where I bumped my carbs up, 
uh, I might bump out of ketosis for a day or two. Whereas now I've been doing this long enough where if I have one of my higher carb days, if I go and I hit the workout the next morning, I'll be back in ketosis right after that workout. So I feel like that timeline just kind of shortens as you get further into it. Um, and it also kind of gives me like this peace of mind of like, uh, like what, 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 is, what is ketosis as a goal versus kind of just a, a, a blank target that you maybe would be aiming for. Um, so yeah, other kind of areas of interest that I'm kind of thinking about in terms of just making sure I don't necessarily latch onto what I've been doing and think to myself, well, this is what works for me. There's nothing that could be better is I want to keep an open mind and keep trying new things to some degree uh, to see what else is out there, see if there's anything better or anywhere that I can improve on. So some areas that uh, I'm just interested in are like the protein versus carbohydrate. Um, I think a lot of times when folks take on a high fat, low carb approach or a ketogenic approach, um, along with the restriction of carbohydrates comes kind of a restriction of protein. Uh, and I've certainly played around with that to some degree as well, or lower my protein down to 10% and stuff like that. And uh, I'm getting more interested <coughs> in some of the work from guys like uh, Dr. Ben Bickman, uh, Dr. Ted Naiman. Uh, like, what role does protein play in, in the sense of providing both recovery, but as well as um, you know a different way to kind of process uh, glucose in the way of gluconeogenesis. So. And one thing I might play around with in the coming years or months is kind of those ranges of protein and whether that would allow me to bring my peak carbohydrate training phases down lower and just kind of try to flush out some information from that. Uh, so other things too is like other sports. Uh, some things I've always been curious about is like, well, what sports are most conducive to ketosis or high fat, low carb? Which ones are the hardest ones to kind of figure out? And um, one thing that really fascinates me is it seems like the more intense you go, the almost better you can make it work. And when I say intense, I mean like, you know, someone doing something that's so brief that they're never gonna really exhaust their glycogen stores. So someone doing like a 100 meter dash or like a power lifting competition or something like that where the event is over a like, snap of a finger almost. Um, you know, you have a situation like that, they're doing a lot of, much higher intensity workouts for a much shorter period of time. You've got this longer stretch of recovery time, so these slower glycogen replenishing processes through fats and proteins have more time to kind of take place. And then you have folks kind of in between myself as an ultra endurance runner and those short event folks who are kind of training just long enough and just hard enough to exhaust their glycogen stores on a regular basis. They might be training multiple times a day, like another sport that would be like kind of a perfect fit for that would be like mixed martial arts. Those folks are oftentimes doing a fair bit of intensity and doing a variety of different things like two or three times a day sometimes. Like where does the role of like re, re or putting glycogen like, back in the muscles through carbohydrate versus something like proteins and fats, um, where does that kind of all like place? So it's just interesting stuff in, in, in my opinion, but uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of those tweener sports, like uh, you know, rugby, soccer, a lot of that other stuff too, where like the match or something is 60 minutes in length, so there's just a lot of fast bursts, but you still have to be able to be out there for 60 minutes, so you're playing with a lot of different variables then. It's interesting stuff, but uh, that's all I have from a structure presentation standpoint, so I'm more than happy to answer some questions if you have some about kind of what I'm doing or what I feel about stuff and all that. Yeah. So as you switch, from you know uh, keto to adding more carbs, are you noticing any changes in your GI, any GI issues as you switch? Uh, yeah, you know the interesting thing about GI for me, and I think this is this sometimes becomes pretty individual, uh, and I actually think this is what sometimes drives people into the approach. Is the thing I've noticed is that like. Uh, or one, one metric I guess I've used to know that I kind of think this process is gonna work for me and others is that like when I was racing high carb, I would take in 400-ish calories per hour on a pretty regular basis uh, just to kind of maintain the energy and intensity for whatever I was doing. 
whereas I can cut that down over half now. So just the susceptibility to GI stress when you're taking in the amount of carbohydrate that I will take in during an event is, is low enough where it's, I just don't think it's enough to really upset my stomach to, to, in most cases. So I haven't really had any GI issues um, since I've started uh, doing kind of the high fat approach. Uh, race settings and stuff, or big like workouts, long workouts that are maybe like three, four hours in duration or something like that. You know, usually I'm doing, if it's like a big important race, I'll, let, I'll take in sometimes upwards of 200 calories an hour. That's about the most. And then if it's more or less like a, a training race or like a B-level race, sometimes I'll let that get down under 100 calories an hour. Um, and that's just doesn't seem to be enough to really upset my stomach. So I haven't really had a whole lot of, uh, I'd be interested to see like if other people would still get GI at even those low amounts, but is that kind of the direction? Well, it's just something I've noticed as I mm -hmm. cycle back and forth between, you know, I go from, sure. I, I go to a high fat meal, mm -hmm. that's the problem. Oh, so you get GI, so it's just, like, <clears throat> so you have to give it time. Yeah, it's yeah. Just well, yeah, and there's, there's so many variables in that, that, uh, category two in terms of what upsets one person's stomach might not upset someone else's stomach. Um, you know, I think we see that with like the carnivore movement now too. You're having people who are removing foods that other people are like, well, I eat a ton of that and it doesn't do me any problems. And these people are removing it and seeing like huge like uh, improvements on stuff like that. So um, I think it is very individual. From my, from my standpoint, um, I think some of it has to do with like I kind of switched over to this before it really fell apart for me um, you know this is a conversation I have a lot of times more frequently now is like or a question I guess I get is like if you're if, if what you're doing is what works why are people winning gold medals in the Olympics not following your exact program and uh, <laughs> and I think I think that's a great way to kind of simplify the issue because what we're dealing with with like an elite athlete at the Olympic level is somebody who was probably very good at that event at an early age and they got identified, well this person's gonna be a great cross country runner, this person's gonna be a great 800 meter runner and they've been channeled into that world at an early age and we eventually they break their way through high school, college, semi-pro, pro, Olympics, you know, maybe a medal. Uh, that person kind of went through the program and made it through. What we're not looking at is all the people that had that kind of potential at the early age but fell on the wayside somewhere along the way. Um, you know, they didn't make it through the so-called meat grinder of the approach. Like, so a lot of these, these athletes, I think, they're doing what they're told um, based on what we've seen work in a standard American diet context for years and years and years. Um, and until we start looking at the people who fall on the wayside in like college, semi-pro because of whatever reason um, and, and maybe try a nutritional intervention versus a, like, oh, you just don't have it anymore kind of an approach. I think that's when we're gonna start to see some more folks uh, rise to those high spots in sport with a lower carbohydrate kind of a structure. Um, so I think sometimes it's about catching it early is what I'm saying. Like, and then if you don't catch it early, you might deal with some more like you know, GI issues in the early stages to try to like kind of fix some of the damage that's been done. Yeah. Uh, Zach, can you comment a little more on what exactly do you eat during a race? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I guess I'm more specific as to if you are taking in carbohydrates, what kind of mm -hmm. carbohydrates? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one. And uh, I think it's confusing to a lot of people, especially when they kind of first get into it, is the first thought is, okay, if I'm eating, especially someone who's, because there's folks who do lower carbs than I do and seemingly do just fine. So I think there's a context that works well depending on uh, like where you're coming from, what your, your goals are and things like that, and, and age I think too. Uh, so like the first thought though is like if I'm someone who's eating very low amount of carbohydrates, less than 10% on average, I should probably be eating very low carbohydrates in the race itself or eating fat in the race itself, especially when you get into like you know, a race where fueling makes a lot of sense, like you get in the marathon and beyond, you know, most people, regardless of their nutrition plan, is probably gonna be eating something. Uh, so a lot of people will start turning to like a, like a fat source of fuel during a race, 
And um, I think there's a distance long enough where that makes sense. Um, but I think when you're getting into most races that are like, you know, a half a day to a day in length, um, what people are kind of missing is that like even the leanest athletes out there have enough body fat to kind of make it through a long endurance event. What they don't have a big enough energy tank for is their glycogen source. So um, when you're in a race where digestive issues can be one of the limiting factors, I think you want to eliminate as much digestion as possible without sacrificing performance. So eating exogenous fat during a race is kind of asking your body to use fat that is going to require a digestive tract versus um, you know like bypassing the digestive tract altogether and burn body fat. Uh, because like, you know, I, the, at the end of a race, like I can eat a ton of fat really easily and put back on whatever fat I burned off my body during the event itself. <coughs> um, so I feel like that's just a better time to do it. Uh, so during the race then, I'm kind of thinking about just keeping my glycogen stores at a point where if I do want to hit that, you know, hit the gas pedal, I have that, that stuff. So I'm just kind of trickling in a little bit of uh, carbohydrate during the race, like I kind of mentioned before, at a much lower rate than I did historically when I was following a high carb. And um, I use, uh, um, I like to do liquid calories mostly, just because I think they kind of are a little, bit, little easier and you kind of kill two birds with one stone to some degree when you're hydrating and getting your fuel in at the same time. So I've used a product called Fuel 5 for that for since 2012. And that's kind of got like a different release point carbohydrate strains, so something as more complex like sweet potato and something a little more fast acting too, so you have kind of a like steady supply. But you know, that's the energy tank that I think is potentially can be depleted. So that's the one I'm gonna kind of trickle in small parts during the race itself. After the race, won't touch the stuff. <laughs> so like that's when I'm gonna take in like really fatty meals, you know, like um, you know, all kinds of different, uh, you know, like fatty meats and you know, nut butter type stuff and like oils and things like that. Uh, yeah, that's that's my recovery recovery food. <laughs> um, and I should also say before too, because I think a lot of times people wonder like, what do you eat before the race? Like the morning of, what's for breakfast? And uh, um. yeah, it's it's interesting because uh, I think um, when you start a race, I think you want to start the race burning high levels of fat. You don't want to trigger your body to go glycolytic right away. Um, you want to spare that as much as you can. So for breakfast, that's when I'm gonna have, you know, like, um, you know, have like uh, coffee and heavy whipping cream with like an act bomb or something like that. Uh, that's gonna be a fatty based breakfast, not take up a bunch of room in my stomach so I don't feel full the starting line, um, but still get some energy in at the start of the day. Cause I mean, it's a long day. You run a uh, hundred miles at, I ran hundred miles at Western States it was like just under 17 and a half hours. So to not eat breakfast, I think is like, you know, <laughs> if I can avoid it, yeah. I mean, some people do. And uh, you know, there, it, there's probably a, a little bit of a, just like a routine in there with that. But I don't, I don't see a reason to load up on a carby, a heavy carb breakfast in the morning before either. Is that about three in the morning? Sometimes, yeah. yeah like, Western starts at five, so that one is pretty early. Some of them are a little more gentle, like Desert Solstice is an eight o'clock start, so you can be a little more uh, um, a little more relaxed for that one, but there's some early starts. <laughs> yeah? How much pressure do you feel on yourself because of the success that you've had in the ultras? Yeah, um, I don't know, like it's, it's always been something that I've, I feel like I deal with all right because for one, ultra running is still kind of a niche sport, so it's not like ESPN is calling me or I'm not. Sure. <laughs> 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 <It's good. laughs> um, and the other thing too is like, you know, when I was when I competed in college at, at University of Stevens Point, like they were like a top in the country Division three program, um, and I was very moderate amongst our top guys on the team. Like I wasn't like a rock star by any means at the like. 10K, 5K, 8K level. So like I never really grew up in a sense thinking like, well, my destiny is to be the best at this. So for me, it's a, like a lot of the motivation to even do the sport has come from me kind of s trying to see like, well, how far can I take myself versus like, well, can I beat this other person? 
or can I beat this other person's time? Those are some good motivators, I think, at times. But uh, you know, for me, the pressure doesn't really come from that as much. Um, and it's more about curiosity and enjoying the process of getting to it. Like, I'll, I'll talk to people about this quite a bit. It's like, as soon as I stop enjoying the process of getting to the race, is when I'm gonna stop doing the sport. Because like, when you think about it, even like a, an event that's, I mean, there's some, there's some ultra marathons that are six days long. You see how far you get in six days. And even that event is very short compared to the amount of work done to get to it. So if you're not enjoying the process getting to it, then why are you doing it? This kind of thing. So a lot of it to me is just, I think, kind of trying to put yourself in the right, the right mental headspace in that regard and try to be honest with yourself about why you're doing it and what you're doing. Um, so um, I don't know that it's, I'm, I'm sure it could get much more pressure induced if it was just more popular. And um, there's certainly some of that, but feel like I can do a pretty good job of kind of focusing in on that. Yeah, let's go back. Go right there, yeah. Okay. Um, so on your 17 hour effort, when do you start trickling in your car? Um, usually about, usually I'll aim for about 45 minutes or so in, okay. give or take. I want to get moving a little bit because then my, like, once you get moving with kind of like a, like a, a fattier breakfast, you know, your body's gonna start kind of getting that fat burning engine going. So then when I do start trickling it in, it's less likely to like send me in a more glycolytic avenue than where, as if I would like say take a drink of a sports drink or something right at the starting line. So yeah, it's usually once I get around that 45 minute mark is where I'll start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you say like trickle it in, just give us like real specifics on what you're doing. Is this like sure. a sip of that and that's mm -hmm. all you're having and that's another sip and about half yeah. hour later? Usually what I'll do is I'll do like, a, I'll have like a bottle that's probably 16 to 20 ounces of water and I'll mix in um, anywhere between 100 to 200, usually about 100 though, more often than not, calories of, uh, of the fuel vibe. And then I'll just sip at that however long it takes me to like finish that bottle. And that's usually around 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, and then if, if that's enough for that part in time, then I just wait till I'm ready to fuel again. Or if I want a little more than that, sometimes I'll grab random stuff too. Like the nice thing about ultra marathons nowadays is it's like we've gotten spoiled in the number of aid stations they have. <laughs> so like you can do like, there's so many options at them too. Like you can run in there and then like um, decide, well, I kind of feel like that and have that. So I'll do like all the random things over the course of the race just to mix it up too. Like every aid station has like uh, um, deep is soda for the most part. And like, I think soda as a whole is probably one of the worst things for you, but it, they seem to work very well in the context of a hundred mile races. So sipping on that for, for a little bit, like especially near the end of the race, I think is, is something maybe I would grab off the main station just to kind of like stay in whatever window of calories I'm trying to hit. Yeah, Ross? Yeah. I so, I know I've heard you talk a lot about how keto has helped your endurance, but how much of an impact do you think it's had on your improved recovery time compared to others? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to tell, like, from a grand scheme, because I guess I'll find out when I get, like, older and... <laughs> <laughs> but, so I'd like to look at folks that are doing it that have almost defied ages, like uh, if you're familiar, if you follow ultra running at all, there's a guy named Jeff Browning who follows a very similar program that I do. Um, he's 47 years old uh, and he's been third, fourth, and fifth the last three years at the Western States 100 and this year he was fifth. Four weeks later went and won the Hard Rock 100. He's 47 years old and like, he should be retired, right? Like he's, <laughs> if, you look at, if you look at any other sport and he's been doing it for a while, like he actually, he won something like, I think, or I think he ran like something like 1600 milers and contemplated stopping and then he switched his diet and now he's performed better than he ever was when he was in his 30s. So it's like, it's really fascinating. So like from a long-term standpoint, I'm looking at guys like that and saying, okay, well, what's going on here? If this guy's able to kind of push the timeline back. Um, but from, a, from an immediate standpoint, um, the thing I've noticed is just like when I was high carb, uh, I would finish a race, like a goal race, and I would take maybe like three complete days off, like wouldn't move, and then I start kind of gradually starting to run again. Like I didn't even want to think about doing anything but a really slow, like easy run for at least two weeks after that. Whereas now, like if I take that same amount of days off, like I may be just as sore, 
the day after the race as I was with whatever program I was using. But what I kind of, what I noticed is like, if I wanted to do a workout, I could do that much sooner. So like, to me, like, you know, I've talked to, to Dr. Bollock about this in the past, and it's, it seems like it's, a lot of it's just like, you're getting a lot of those like, kind of like inflammatory processes clearing out quicker. Because a lot of the muscle soreness after a big effort like that is, I mean, there's certainly muscle breakdown, but there's also like just swelling and inflammation that's occurring that's causing that pain to kind of linger around in your legs. Um, so I think from that standpoint, like I can turn around and get back into another program for another race a lot quicker. Yeah. So this is maybe more of a philosophical question, but going back to the idea of the carb cycling. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of fueling the thing you're actually doing with the types of fuel it requires. Mm -hmm. But for the average endurance athlete who's not, who's, you know, not putting in 17 hours mm -hmm. of the and you care about being fat and keto adapted, is there a point, maybe like a tipping point or a point of diminishing returns where, although they might perform a little better if they fuel their higher, longer, you know, higher end, longer workouts with carbs, holding those carbs back and continuing to try to force their body to run primarily off fat and ketones is a better strategy in terms of maybe like long-term health, uh, recovery, you know, I mean like the flip side of that is that, you know, you put in the carbs, maybe get more oxidative mm -hmm. stress, maybe you suppress fat burning for a while, whatever. So do you, I mean, if you're working with an athlete who's not at nearly elite level, mm -hmm. do you find that you change that strategy at all? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the biggest, like, uh, things we look at is the amount of time you're spending out there training. Like, there's, the, it's, you know, a lot of things, sometimes people think, oh, this person's running 100 miles, they must run 100 miles on training runs. And, <laughs> and, and that's just not the case. I mean, there's people that are doing it on, like, much lower volume approaches, like, six, seven hours a week sometimes even. So, like, you know, that person, I think, is gonna be much more likely to be able to kind of, like, avoid bringing back carbohydrates, because they're just, they're giving them, this kind of goes back to what I was saying before, where there's, like, more time between big efforts then. So, like, they have more time to replace any potential glycogen loss, uh, you know, through, through fats and proteins that wouldn't necessarily even need to do that with, like, with, with a, a, a concentrated carbohydrate source. Um, but, you know, health and, uh, and just, um, Health and and, and uh, other goals too, like weight loss and stuff, are I look at as different kind of approaches. Like if I have an athlete who comes to me and they're like, "All right, I have these goals. I want to do well at this race, which is eight months down the road. But first, I want to lose 15 pounds. I feel like I'm 15 pounds heavier than I was when I was in high school and college, and I want to get back to that. Um, you know, we're gonna approach that a lot differently um, because at that point, it's like we're not focusing purely on performance. The other kind of, uh, I think, more or less elephant in the room when it comes to ultra marathons is like, are these things healthy to begin with? Right. <laughs> and it's like, I can tell you from almost certainty that a hundred, running 100 miles as fast as you can is not healthy. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's fun to some degree. I mean, it's, it's, fun until, it's, fun, it's, it's fun until about mile 70 and then it sucks for about 30 miles and then yeah, it's fun when you finish. But like, it's, it's like, I think the human body is designed to move long distances at a very like modest pace. Uh, but I don't think it was necessarily meant to run 100 miles to the point where you're like just getting across the finish line. So like you're fighting an uphill battle in the sense of health to begin with there. So then if the person, if their goal is like, I want to be as healthy as possible and participate in this sport. And for them, it's like if they run, you know, 20 minutes faster or 20 minutes slower, it's not that big of a deal. We're going to be a lot, a lot more likely just to do everything we can to eliminate any potential health risks. Um, and some of this too is, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm practicing this stuff um, based on a lot of my own feedback and feedback I'm getting from athletes that I'm working with and other people are doing the approach too. So, uh, like, who's to say that, uh, you know, in 10 years there won't be people who are like, well, Zach, you're an idiot, you don't need to bring carbs back. You can go zero carb and, you know, and so like, you know, I, yeah, I'm open to seeing what other people are doing with that um, and having them show, show approaches that work for them. Uh, it's, that seem to be like you know the money spot for them, I guess. But so for the sorry, for the people who don't care so much about the twenty minutes here or there, you would be less likely to carb cycle in as rigorously. Is that what you mean? Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah, and you know some of it too is like 
Like I'd be less, I'd also be less likely to put them, the, the part of the intensity side of my training is what I call the unsustainable part of the year. It's the, the, re, the reason I don't do that part of it year round is because I wouldn't be able to do it year round. Um, I mean, I love that section of training because I'm as fit as I ever am, but it's like you're, you're working on that, you're sharpening that spear uh, and if you don't let it dull eventually, it, it'll break on you eventually. So like you have to be kind of careful with that to begin with. Um, so some folks too, if they're not as like interested in, in max performance, like we, we were a lot more careful with that side of the training program even too. They might be doing less of those during the course of the year too. Because you know, a lot of folks, they're not trying to peak for like two or three races a year. They might, they might do that many, but they might say like, I really just want to do really well at this one race in November. So like we might not even touch that type of training until we get like closer to the race itself. So you kind of eliminate some of that in terms of its frequency as well. That's my follow up question. Um, I'm an older runner now, so I'm just gonna do a marathon a year. That's plenty for me at mm -hmm. my age. So how are you playing with how many A races does it make sense for me to train uh -huh. and fall back, you know? Yeah. Think about that, because that's a lot of effort for one race, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think you can, like, I think you can probably reasonably do two or three A races in a year when you're talking about marathon and beyond, and actually expect to hit the nail on the head, so to speak. I think when you get past that, you start having races where, like, you, you, you tried hard, but maybe you got, like, 90 95% out of yourself, because, uh, I think it, the interesting thing is when you get up to a point where you do a race where you feel like you really nailed it and you just exhausted yourself, like the mental and physical recovery, like I can, I can point to races I've done in the past where I knew I pushed harder just because it took me longer to get ready to go back to it again afterwards. And I can point to races where I, I didn't nail as much because like the re I was able to get back into it a lot quicker so I didn't just kind of <coughs> run myself into the ground physically and mentally. So some of it comes down to that. I mean, you look at like the marathon world and these guys and gals are doing two or three a year at the most. So like, um, and I think, not to go on a, a big tangent, but I actually think marathon training is much more difficult than ultra marathon training because you're in such a gray area there where it's a long enough race where you have to do the high volume stuff, but it's a fast enough race where you have to actually be running fast workouts too at race pace. like race pace of a marathon is not easy pace, whereas, you know, like 100 miles, easy pace might actually be faster than race pace sometimes. So like, um, I think you're kind of, a you're, you're working on a system that kind of goes back to what I was saying before, that's a little less sustainable. So they're spending more time in that system, so they're probably gonna be able to peak for less races because they're gonna have to recover from that build up and stuff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you wanna talk a little bit about your podcast? Oh yeah, I should do that. <laughs> yeah, so if you're interested in some of the more, like we get way more into the weeds here than, uh, than I did today. Uh, my co-host, Dr. Sean Baker, um, and I have a podcast called the Human Performance Outliers Podcast. I think we've just released our 26th episode and the 27th will be going up at some point today. Um, we've had some awesome guests. We've been really fortunate in that regard and that's certainly what's helped us get off the ground with it. Um, but uh, a lot of presenters here actually have come on the show. We've had uh, Dave Feldman come on. We've had um, uh, Amber O'Hernis come on. Uh, see who else we have that's here. Uh, Dr. Georgia Eads been on the show. Um, yes, we've had some, some awesome ones uh, come on and just really get into the weeds about uh, um, you know where is the science behind this? What's going on? Like where? Where have we made mistakes in our research and our studies that don't actually point to this, but say points to this? And um, those guys do a much better job than I do uh, about explaining the hows and the whys. So if you really want to get into that, um, check it out, Human Performance Outliers uh, podcast. It's on iTunes, wherever podcasts can be found. And, yeah, they have to go, yeah, they have great. Uh, Peter Ballastet's another one we had on early. So um, he presented yesterday, I believe, and he's, pretty knowledgeable guy about like sustainability and stuff because I think one of the questions we're getting now uh, a lot, you know, you, you you go through the gamut of them from if you've been doing keto high fat for a long time, first it was like where's the science, then it's like where's the longevity and then they keep running out of these reasons to, reasons to not do a high fat low carb approach and then like 
the ones that are kind of still lingering around are like, well, your approach isn't sustainable. If everyone would do that, then we would run out of resources. And Peter Ballister does a good job of actually getting into the, like, you know, some of these stats that we see popping up about like, well, one cow takes X amount of gallons of water. If we would just use that to grow corn, we could get this much more cow. Like, he unpacks all that stuff. And um, so, uh, yeah, we've had some cool guests. We've been excited. So we'll keep bringing them on though. It's been fun. Yeah. Outside of uh, race prep, what do you eat on a regular day to food staples that you have sure. in the fridge? Yeah, I do a lot of like, um, I'll do like, I try to base a lot of my meals around like a fatty cut of meats or something like eggs. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'll do that and then, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I mean, it's changed a bit over the course. Like most recently I'll do a lot of fatty meats with like some fermented vegetables. If I'm in the peak training stuff, like that's when I'll be bringing back a little more carbs. So then my carb sources that I like that um, work the best are like uh, raw honey, um, berries, melons, uh, that sort of thing. Maybe some sweet potatoes or something like that. Um, yeah, then I'll do like uh, some like nut butters type stuff from time to time as well. Um, and uh, a lot of like clarified butter type stuff, heavy whipping cream, um, full fat cheeses. And I've had a mixed relationship with cheeses. Like I grew up in Wisconsin, so I love it as a kid. And then I seem to have a like a, un, you know, a, a, a weird to, like tolerance rate with dairy, especially like you know reduced fat commercial dairy. But um, so then I've, I've had taken it out of my diet for long periods of times. And then uh, I've got a friend who actually is a uh, He's a research scientist at the University of Michigan. And he's like, you've got to look into fermented dairy and try to kind of build up a, a you know, gut bacteria profile that can tolerate it. And so I've done some of that in the last couple of years that it's, I've been able to do a, a bit more of the kind of full fat dairy sources more recently. So that's been a cool one to be able to head back in. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty simple with it. Like I really enjoy fatty cuts of meat. So I start with that and kind of build out from there. Yeah. What uh, percent body fat do you kind of encourage either your recreational or elite athletes to kind of strive for? Yeah, um, I think that can be a little individual too. I think, you know, in some, some people I think just for whatever reason, genetics are gonna be more prone to stay lean for longer periods of time. So a lot of times what I try to do is like, we try to identify like, um, assuming the person's like reasonably at like race weight or around it, like we try to identify like, well, let's look at your best performances and kind of where you were at for that. Um, because I think that's kind of, that's kind of a razor's edge as well, where like um, there's a power weight ratio, but um, once you get past that, you know, like just dropping the weight doesn't necessarily mean power is gonna stay station, stationary. So, uh, you know, more generally speaking, you know, for men, it's like, you know, usually like if they're down to five, eight percent, like going much below that, it doesn't seem very productive from a performance standpoint at, at the endurance side of thing. And then, you know, women, um, I mean, I'm no expert with body fat composition either. So I'm just saying what like, you know, others have told me for the most part, but you know, women are probably gonna be in, in higher ranges of like, you know, maybe nine to 15% or something like that when they're just at race, race type stuff. But, um, they're smarter people than me with that, so <laughs> don't stop digging at me. <laughs> yeah. What suggestions do you have for anyone trying to shave some time off their race pace? Shave, shave time off their race pace? Um, from a training side of things, I think like uh, specificity is always king. So look at where your race is, what environment is on. Is it like a flat road? Is it a trail? Is it hilly? Is it, you know, all these other variables. Um, and then look at what your race pace goal is and put the more specific stuff close to the race itself. So like um, if race pace, if you're training for like a five kilometer race, you know, that pace is gonna be different than like a marathon. So putting the workouts that are closer to 5K pace close to that race is kind of what I think is the most productive in terms of competing for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of the short answer, I guess, is you want me to dive in more. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, why do you use kind of the man heart rate training to be from being in that fat burning zone? Mm -hmm. Do you find um, many people that don't fit that, that need a higher heart rate, that they just don't know where they're going mm -hmm. or that ultimately they can all get down? 
Yeah, I think uh, where people start from is different. Um, like I've had athletes that you know they're been training for long, slow races for a long time, and it's actually funny. Like I actually they have to work really hard to get up to max pace sometimes. So uh, you know that person's a little different than say someone who's just been running kind of uh, more or less at the wrong paces at the wrong times, and sometimes they end up in a scenario where. Uh, they have to slow down to get to their map, right? So I'm gonna approach those two differently, but like the other thing to look at too is like, is the 180 minus your age number, is that kind of universal? Um, and like the short answer is it works for a lot of people, but there's definitely outliers that it doesn't work for. So if I have an athlete where we are gonna start out like with their base training with a mass up and they're reporting back to me like, like my math pace is so easy, I'm walking all the time, or my math pace is so hard, I feel like I just did a sprint workout after it. We're gonna do a more structured test to figure out what their max heart rate is. And the one I like the most is we'll have them do a 30 minute time trial, where they pace themselves evenly, but as hard as they can for 30 minutes. And then we'll dissect the last 20 minutes of that and look at what their average heart rate was in that frame. Um, and that's gonna be more, I think, uh, individual to their 180, their personal 180 number, I guess you could call it. So you know all some athletes that we suspect they have a higher max heart rate, and they'll do that test and they find out, oh, they're 190, so we'll do 190 minus their age, or maybe they're 170, so we'll do 170 minus their age instead. I've been doing market training for a while now, and it's still a variable factor. It's not like the be all end all. Mm -hmm. If you had a four night sleep, right. you drink a little more coffee, uh -huh. Stress out, that's going to play with your heart rate a little bit too, but it's a good gauge to see where you're yeah. it's covering a, and stuff like that too. It's a tool. Yeah. It's a tool, and, and I say that because like there's so many factors that can affect it on race day as well. Um, you know, the most common one in ultra marathon running is just like cardiac drift in the sense that like, you know, if you're going to be out there for, you know, 10, 12, 14 it's hours. Gonna happen, right? right, yeah, like yeah. I think the heart rate is much more accurate within that first couple hours. So we're dealing with distance races that are like, you know, marathon and below, then I think it, you can kind of lean on those numbers a little better. Um, and then I also think that like, what you're doing if you do a strict map of tone or like a strict maximum aerobic function type of a thing is, especially for like something like a marathon, is you're getting yourself super fit within a very tiny parameter. So if you stay in that parameter, you're bulletproof. But if you go outside that parameter, you blow up very easily. <laughs> so um, I was talking to a guy the other day who got, or a while ago actually, he got his map pace down to like, it was like in the like 545 per minute per mile. So it was like right at his marathon. Yeah, so it was like, it was right at his <laughs> He was fit, he, was fit. He, he really exhausted that system. And so he could go out and run that 545 for a marathon, but if he would have one mile on that marathon where he decided to ratchet down and run 525, yeah. he'd probably blow up. Wow. So like he didn't have like that, like you have to really ask you have yourself. The flexibility there too. Yeah, so sometimes it depends, like, so are, do you want to respond to like a move that someone makes in a race? If you do, you know, then map could get trickier, I think. Um, but I think it's an excellent, it's a way to build your foundation, and then you can bring in the specificity stuff after you have that foundation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, none of you will offend me either if you want to leave. If, if you if you're not don't have questions too, I can stick around as long as anyone wants. But um, if you got other things to head to, feel free to. Um, <laughs> scores that I can think of that I've got. Um, I've been, a, hey, did you go to a Dave Felsman's talk yesterday? Yeah, so I think, uh, I, I like the idea of blood work, um, but I think that the, the, the thing with blood work that I'm a little bit like skeptical about is that like you're taking a snapshot with blood work. Yeah. So, if I'm not getting blood tested on a super regular basis, like you know how Dave Elvin does it, it's really hard to draw real concrete conclusions about what's going on. Because 
I think as we're unpacking that stuff more and more and more, we're realizing how easily you can manipulate some of those scores uh, by accident or on purpose. So for me to go in and get my blood tested twice a year might not tell me a whole lot uh, unless I'm getting them tested at the exact same time every year over the course of many years under the same circumstances. So like not like in the middle of peak training one time and then during recovery phase the next time because that's probably going to be completely two different scores. But it's still, and it's still inflammation though? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I'll, I'll get them. I get them. If you go to my, my uh, website at zachfitter.com, I've got some like uh, blood, like they're, they're, I should probably update some of them, um, but I do have some uh, like tests and stuff that look at like uh, um, lipid profiles and different mineral counts and things like that on there. Did your cholesterol go up when you started? Okay. Um, it went, it, it, it didn't, so my cholesterol scores were like pretty great before it, like that was never a driving force for me to switch my diet. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to look back to see the exact numbers. I think my HDL went up and my LDL went down, um, but that was kind of in the early stages too. I'd have to do another test to really get, get uh, a lot of concrete, but even even so, it's like the Dave Feldman makes me question all those things now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, just question about uh, F bomb. Like, when do you use those? Kind of, you said before the race. Uh -huh. Is that kind of how you use that as a supplement or like as your Yeah, I'll, I use them a lot more on like the day to day stuff than I do like during a workout itself. So like. Um, I mean, I travel quite a bit, so they're a great thing to pack along. It's like if I'm in an airport or if I have a, like a five hour drive to San Diego from Phoenix, you know, <laughs> it beats you know, stopping at uh, the gas station and grabbing whatever they have on, on, the, on the rack there. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I use them a lot more in my, in my, my normal day to day nutrition. Um, if I'm going to do like a um, like a longer effort out on the trails or something that's lower intensity and stuff like that, I'll bring some of them along too. Uh, just because like, some, it, to some degree it comes down to like, you know, if I'm gonna do like a four or five hour training run, I'm taking a big chunk out of the day where I'm not eating a structured meal at all. So it's like, do I really wanna try to like, s catch up on all those calories after? And you know, it really depends on what's coming up next. Like if I've got a big training week coming up, I probably want to be more diligent about getting getting in the fuel uh, rather than trying to replace it like down the road afterwards. So I would bring them out for something like that too. Yeah. What's your thought on a two to three hour run doing fasted versus having fats prior to uh -huh. doing that? Yeah, I think it depends on your goal. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so she has like, she looks at fasting a different way than I think most people do. So she's looking at fasting in the sense that like, anything but water is gonna essentially reset your clock in terms of like, your body's like, uh, more or less circadian rhythm in terms of the eating cycle. Mm -hmm. And she said that she, uh, like she identified like, that humans optimize at like somewhere in like an eight to 10 hour window of eating. Um, so like if I wake up in the morning and have a cup of dark coffee or black coffee, I started my clock regardless if there's no calorie content there or not. So if I'm looking for just like a, a fasting from the sense of like um, keeping that window between eight to 10 hours, then that's like I think something that is a meaningful way to look at it. Uh, but if I'm looking at it like fasting in the sense of like fasting from having an, an exogenous carbohydrate source, then I think your options open up quite a bit because then it's like if you have like you know coffee with uh, you know pure fat in there, then you know you're not essentially triggering that side of things. Um, I look at fasting differently in endurance than I do in other avenues too because I think at some point you have to start looking at less about time and more about energy expenditure. So like I can look at the day as 24 hours or I can look at the day as like how much energy did I require for that day. And I think that makes a difference with fasting too because what I found is like if I get too strict or I still get too strict about fasting and they're doing like consistently doing two to three hour runs, they're consistently like driving this, this really big energy 
uh, energy deficit on a regular basis, and I just don't know what kind of signals that's potentially sending to the to a body that is being asked to be pretty active on a regular basis. So I think I think a lot of that stuff probably needs to be dug into a little more. That's just kind of what I suspect, though. Oh, question that I'm very skeptical about. Other than the intermittent fasting, like we're talking about with Dr. Ron Patrick, mm -hmm. you know, um, where that may have sensed for various athletes. Yeah, From well, the fueling and recovery yeah. standpoint. And it, it might not make sense because, like, it, you know, when you're when you're looking at someone who's demanding that much energy from themselves, like um, consolidating yourself to a certain like time frame, I think it's probably something that's going to be individually based as well. Like, you know, like there's other factors too, like um, your work schedule yeah. and, you know, a lot of stuff like, you know, there's a lot of things that need to consider when it comes to fasting and, and fasting is a stressor. So you also have to, you know, I was talking to someone about this the other day. It's like, there's all these cool little hacks, right? Like fasting, cold showers, all these weird things that kind of are like sort of uncomfortable, at least at first. And I think you have to be careful when you start to stack those things all on top of each other, because at the end of the day, it's like you want to stress yourself enough to get stronger or make an improvement, but you don't necessarily want to stress yourself so much that you know you're not recovering from that stuff. So, yeah. Uh, you mentioned buy fuel pre-race. What do you use post-race, and what do you think about CBDs? Um, post-race is uh, where, like, especially if it's like a goal race where I'm not gonna, I'm resetting the training cycle. I'm going like super low carb, so like I'll go and get like a, a real fatty steak. What about supplements? Supplements? Yeah. Um, I'll do, uh, I don't do a ton of supplementation. Um, I haven't played around a ton with CBD oils yet, but it seems like there's a lot of promising stuff around that. So, what are CBD oils? What's that? What are CBD oils? CBD oils are like, so they're like uh, the non-psychoactive portion of like cannabis. So they've been linked to like uh, like infl like reducing inflammation and things like that. So there's a lot of kind of, I guess more or less newer research. I can't speak to it like in a very like deep manner because I just don't know as much. I know I know like what I've seen, you know, other people saying and stuff. Uh, I mean, it's something that I'm interested in enough where I think I'll probably look into it more and eventually maybe try it and see what see what's going on with it. Um, but would you use all the supplements? I'm just wondering what, you know, I, I'm going to look in the five fuel and then mm. post runs or races, yeah. just, you know, usually it's uh, treat yourself to a good meal and a right. bunch and, of water. Yeah, and that's going to that's gonna check most of the boxes, I think. I'll do like uh, like a multivitamin called immune support by the same company. Um, I look at that type of stuff more or less as a safety valve than I do like something that is going to like definitely like do a 180 on recovery or something like that. Um, uh, but yeah, like electrolytes, I think, are something that are pretty, like, I'll do, I think you get a lot of that through your nutrition, too. If, for whatever reason, it's, like, a little harder to do that, I'll use Hydro-X, which is just a powder that's more or less calorie-free for the most part. Um, and it's got a pretty good blend of electrolytes. Magneto, like, Epsom salt bath, love doing that, like, because I think you're, uh, you're, especially with an ultramarathon, I think you're running the risk of lowering some of that stuff and just feels good after an ultramarathon. Yeah, you are, was it crypto, what do we, we do you like freezing? Cryotherapy. Cryo oh, cryotherapy. Yeah. yeah, I haven't done that before, but I actually just connected with a guy in Phoenix who has one of those at his facility. So I'm gonna start trying that out because that seems pretty cool too. Yeah. Can't hurt. <laughs> well, it could hurt if you stay in too long, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, folks, well, um, thanks for coming, and if you think of something, feel free to reach out to me on social media or my website or whatever, or if you see me floating around here, um, I'd love to answer any other questions you have. Thank you.